You're listening to the Galatians Spying Out Our Liberty in Christ series, preached by Pastor Dan Christians at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. Well, we've been in the book of Galatians for quite some time now, and this evening we will be here once again. I said a couple weeks ago that we have looking ahead of us the exciting passage of Scripture we find in the fruit of the Spirit. But we're not going to get there again tonight. Tonight we're going to be looking at the works of the flesh. And so this is kind of like my warning to you that um, if you were coming here looking for the most encouraging, uplifting message that you've ever heard, this is not it. (laughs) The reason that we go through this passage and the reason that we preach it and the reason that we're not going to skip it and, and look forward to something that's more exciting or encouraging is because it is the Word of God and because we need it and because God gave it to us. And so this part is no more important for us to hear than all those encouraging and exciting parts. As we look at our flesh tonight, we get a real picture of who we are. The title of the message tonight is The Enemy in Plain Sight. And the giveaway is that the enemy is us. We are the enemy. We are our own worst enemy. And so in the book of Galatians, we have seen very clearly Paul lay out justification by faith alone, apart from any works of the law. That's been his goal so far, that he spent four chapters doctrinally proving to us from the Old Testament, from experience, from the fact that God spoke to him, that justification comes by faith alone. That is the gospel, that it's not our works. And then he begins, and he starts explaining to us what the sanctification process looks like. And it doesn't look a whole lot different than the justification process. Here, as we get into the sanctification process, it's not that we all of a sudden go back and we pick up the law that could never save us in the first place. Okay? Paul is not telling us that what, what you need to do as a believer is now go and pick up the burden that you could never carry before. What Paul is trying to say to us now is that Sanctification happens in a very similar manner as salvation. Salvation happens because the Holy Spirit of God makes us alive. We put our trust and faith in Christ, and then he saves us, and he quickens us. And now we have the Holy Spirit in us. And so it's important that we make this distinction. Paul is not saying that there is no virtue in the law. He's not saying that the moral law is not good. In fact, he he makes the opposite argument. The moral law is good. It's given to us by a good and holy God, and it reveals to us his moral character. So Paul is not saying, don't worry about the law because it it means absolutely nothing to you. It it is, you know, an irrelevant thing that is in times past. No, the law does reveal to us who God is. And the Bible clearly tells us that we ought to be holy. We ought to be like God. We ought to try and live in godliness. Instead, what he's doing is he's defining the purpose of the law, it, the, the initial and most important purpose of the law is that it shows us our need for a Savior. It shows us all that we fall short. None of us stand before the Ten Commandments and say, yeah, I got that covered. I did all those things for my whole life. We all stand guilty before the law. So, he sh- so the law is there to show us our need for the Savior, but then what he's doing is he's also altering our motivation for keeping the law. See, now I don't keep the law because... It'll save me. I don't keep the law because I'm going to to merit some favor with God. Now, I keep the law because I see the love of the Father. I see that God loved me so much that he sent his son to die in my place. And now that I see the goodness of God, the sinfulness of me, I see the, the glory of how great God is and the fact that he was willing to send his son to die on my behalf. Now I have this new motivation to keep the law. I'm not keeping it because I'm afraid I'm not keeping it because of fear of the consequences. I'm keeping it because I love God who loved me first. It changes our motivation for keeping the law. It gives us such a, a greater motivation. And so two, two weeks ago, we began a series of messages that could be titled Freedom and Victory by the Spirit. That the freedom that we all long for is never going to be found in us defining our freedom based on our fleshly motives. It's not that, well, now I have freedom, I get to do whatever I want. I get to fulfill whatever passions and desires I want. No, we find that what the Bible does is it says, you have freedom in Christ, and this is what true freedom really is. So God defines and designs freedom for us. 
This is what John Stott said about this passage. He said, this passage is simply full of the Holy Spirit. He is mentioned seven times by name. He is presented as our sanctifier, who alone can oppose and subdue our flesh, enable us to fulfill the law so that we are delivered from its harsh dominion, and cause the fruit of righteousness to grow in our lives. You see that? It's the Holy Spirit that is able to do all the things that our flesh could never do. He goes on to say, So the enjoyment of Christian liberty depends on the Holy Spirit. True, it is Christ who sets us free, but without the continuing, directing, sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, our liberty is bound to degenerate into license. And that is exactly what we see over and over again when we have believers who attempt to live the Christian life in their own strength. They fail time and time and time again. Freedom, our freedom, is to be used by love to serve one another. And when we do that, when we love each other, when we love God, when we serve one another, then we fulfill the whole law. We will be free from the bondage and the curse of the law. Here's the problem problem we all run into is our flesh. We still have our flesh. Yes, we have a new nature, but we still have the old nature, the flesh. At the core of humanity, we are unable to keep God's law in our own power. That's just the fact. There's nothing, there's no moral resolve. You can't pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You can't do anything to do it on your own. And so tonight what I want to do is I want to quickly delve deeper into this notion of our flesh. Jesus said, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, this is something that just rubs against who we are. I want to believe that I can do it on my own. I want to believe that I have some kind of strength that's going to help me to persevere in the Christian life. And what the Bible directs me back to is to say, no, it's not you, it's the Spirit. No, it's not you, it's God in you. And so what is the flesh? What is this that I am dealing with all the time, my old nature? Well, we look at the flesh, the word flesh in the Bible, and we find many, many different meanings. We find at times it's part of the body, it's, it's your skin, at times it's the whole body, at times it's the whole of living creatures, that all the living creatures are called the flesh, at times it's food, at times it's to, to connotate something that is soft, and so if you have a heart of flesh, it's a soft heart, um, at times it's weakness compared to the power of God, the arm of flesh, at times it's relationship, at times it's what it means to be a human. And sometimes in the New Testament, we find that it's, it's the unregenerate, those that are in the flesh compared to those that have the Spirit of God. But the majority of references to the flesh in the New Testament specifically refer to the flesh as being that part of God, part of us that rebels against God's will and God's timing. It is what we want for ourselves. It's, it's our selfish ambition and selfish motivations. It's our selfishness and all of the desires that, that come from those things. It's our flesh. It's all about me. It's about what I want. It's about fulfilling my desires, my lusts. That's the flesh. And is, it is at enmity with God. Romans chapter 6, verse 19, Paul said, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members to servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members to servants to righteousness unto holiness. See, that is the flesh. It, because of the flesh, we yield our members, we yield our body to unrighteousness, to sin, to wickedness. And so in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, Paul gives us this unbelievable statement that is the thesis statement for the rest of the chapter. He says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit. If we walk by the Spirit, we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. This idea of a walk, it implies progression. It is command to the believer to keep every day. We obey the Spirit. We're sensitive to the Spirit. We rely on the Spirit. We have faith. And all of those things, it's how we walk by the Spirit. Verse 17 says, For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. We have the flesh and the Spirit now fighting against one another. It's this ongoing battle, and it's... it's Every day of our lives, we find, you, you, if you're breathing today, you are battling your flesh. Prior to our new birth, God has given us a conscience. 
you have this, this flesh that has its selfish desires, and then you have a conscience that kind of informs you against the flesh. It, it's the law of God written on our hearts. But once you become saved, once you have Christ living in you, the Holy Spirit in you, then you have your Holy Spirit that is, that is informing your conscience and empowering you to overcome your flesh. But the problem is, our old nature, it's still flesh. It's still pulling us the wrong way. Unless we're consciously trying to walk by the Spirit, we have no hope of overcoming the flesh. Even with the Spirit in us, there is this incredible battle that rages on. Prior to the Spirit, we are destined to fail. Now with the Spirit, there is hope. But it doesn't just happen automatically. It's something that we pursue. It's a relationship we pursue. It's effort that we put forth. Galatians 5.18 says, But if you be led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And then in verses 19 to 21, which we'll deal with in detail tonight, Paul spells out for the Galatians and for us what it means to live by the lust of the flesh. And you might ask the question, why is Paul doing this? He's about to list a bunch of sins. Why is Paul doing that? If we have victory in the Spirit, why not just go on to focus on the Spirit? Let's, let's just get on with it, Paul. Let's, let's get the solution. Let's stop talking about the problem. I think it is essentially important that we understand the problem. That we understand the problem as, as a problem, not just that is out there, not just that some people have, and not just that you know, Hitler or some of the really bad guys in the world have, that it's a problem that we have with ourselves. We must be utterly convinced of the depth of our own weakness and fully surrender to our need of help. That's where we have to get tonight. And so really, if, if there was one goal of this message, it would it'd be to say, you are weak, you are helpless, you are sinful. I am too. We need help. And if you leave this place going, I need the Spirit, I can't do it on my own, great, mission accomplished. This past week, uh, Tara... And Spencer, we're sitting on the couch, and, and Spencer started to get a little rough. Spencer's my four-year-old boy. And so he, he was being a little bit too rough. And um, so Tara said to him, said, Spencer, you're being too rough. You've got to stop being so rough. Spencer looked at her with this, like, look, like he's thinking about something really serious. And he says, well, I'm not being as rough as a transformer. <laughs> and, and he's right. He wasn't being as rough as a transformer. But what's funny about that is that Spencer was not convinced of his own roughness. He was looking to a transformer and saying, yeah, I might be being rough, Mom, but this transformer is way worse than me, right? There is someone rougher than me, and this is exactly what we do. We look at ourselves and we say, hey, I'm not that bad. I'm doing pretty well. Look at the transformers. Look at the really wicked people. Look at the really evil people. I am definitely not that bad. My flesh is not as bad as theirs. Um, Let me paint us a clear picture tonight. The greatest enemy that you face is you. Yes, the world entices you. Yes, the devil deceives you. All of those things are true, but the world and the devil depend upon your sinful nature, your flesh, in order to work. And if they don't have your flesh to work with, they have absolutely nothing against you. And so our worst enemy is us. So Paul here, as he does in a number of different books, will walk us through some of the sinful behaviors that are inherent to a life that is lived in the flesh. Paul wants us to see this. He wants us to see that the flesh is bad, that the works of the flesh are very bad, that we have one, and without the Spirit working in us, we have no hope of overcoming it. So let's look at Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 19. And we'll categorize these, these sins into four groups And the first group here is sexually motivated sin. So he says, Galatians 5.19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest. They're they're apparent. They're um, evident. They're obvious. This This is what we all know to be the works of the flesh, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. So here Paul gives the first four in the category of sexual, sexually motivated sin. We have adultery, which is a man or a woman cheating on their spouse can only occur among a married couple cheating on their spouse. We have fornication, which is the Greek word porneia, which is any sexual relationship outside of God's definition of marriage. And so you have God's definition of marriage, which is one man and one woman, and any type of sexual relationship that occurs outside of that covenant is fornication. It's porneia. Okay, it's where we get our word for pornography. 
Then the third word there is uncleanness. And this is just impurity, general impurity. It's, it's whether it's in thought or deed. And the final word there is lasciviousness. And it would be very similar to the word lewdness or debauchery. And the idea there is just somebody who lives a, their entire lives is characterized by this sexual desire, this sexual um, thrust that, that pushes them toward their words and their, their jokes and the places they go and the people they see and everything about their lives just is characterized by lewdness or debauchery. That is lasciviousness. So this is, this is the works of the flesh. Now, very quickly, we, we probably all want to go, okay, I, I know who you're talking about. I've met that guy before. He lives down the street, right? I think very quickly we all do this. And, and we forget that when Paul is speaking here, when Jesus was speaking about sin, he, wasn't, he didn't limit sin to your physical actions. Okay? Even these words here, the word uncleanness, it's certainly not limited to your physical actions. The word um, lasciviousness, it, it's not limited to what you do. It's your heart. And, and if you've ever had a lustful thought, which you have, if you've ever struggled in this area with your mind, this is us. And I'm not trying to say that I'm in here at church with a group of perverts, but the, 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 here's the thing, guys. If we can't be honest at church, where can we be honest? Okay, what Paul is trying to do is he's trying to lay out for us the works of the flesh. And the implication here is that we have these. That, that at, to some degree or another, we struggle with these things. And some of us struggle to greater degrees in different areas. But let's not sit back and pretend like we're perfect. Like this is for somebody else. Like it's referring to our neighbor. It's not. He's speaking to Christian believers. In fact, he's speaking to very, very religious Christian believers at this point. The book of Galatians is, to, is for people who are willing to go really, really far, even past where scripture went, with keeping laws. And so let's, let's put ourselves in this group. Okay? We struggle. Let's be honest. Verse 20, there are two sins in the second group, and it's religiously motivated sin. And so here we have idolatry and witchcraft. And idolatry is any type of image worship. Anytime you're worshiping something other than the creator of God. Okay? Warren Wearsby said, we are to worship God, to love people, and to use things. Instead, we use people, worship self, and love things. And that is what so much of our flesh desires to do. Okay, we don't want to worship God. We don't want to place God up. In fact, it'd be so much easier for us to get rid of God or to, to, to make God really distant from us. Like he's not really concerned with what's going on in our lives. And we worship ourselves. We worship our own desires, our own fleshly lusts. This is idolatry. Yes, it's not setting a statue up and bowing down to it, but it's just as much idolatry as that. When you worship your own flesh... You're worshiping something other than God. That's idolatry. And so we worship ourselves, we use people, we love things. We're guilty of this. Second thing here is witchcraft, and the word is pharmakeia, where we get our word for pharmacy. And so it, do, it certainly does imply sorcery or, or magic or, or trying to use, um, use demonic power for um, psychic abilities. But what they often did is they would use drugs or some type of intoxicant to bring them to this place of trance. And so here he's saying these, these two things. You're trying to, you're worshiping the wrong thing or you're using drugs or you're using something to, to remove you from this world, to place you in a different place, to try and receive some type of information or power from a deity. And so we have sexual sin, we have religious sin, the third category is maybe called antisocial sin. Galatians chapter 5, verse 20 continues to say hatred, variance, emulations, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, and murders. And if we go through that list, we'll find a lot of those things are very connected to one another. You have hatred, which is hostility or enmity with one another. Okay? I'm sorry to say, but this happens so often. Anytime you bring a group of people together, whether it's family, whether it's church, you bring workplace, 
a group of people together, this is what you have. Why? Because it's in all of us. And so you have things like hatred, where there's hostility, or there's enmity, or there's just this underlying current between me and you. You have variance, which is contention or strife. You have emulations, which is jealousy or indignation. The word literally means heat. And so you see something or somebody else, and you just, you're, you're just have this negative hatred, heat toward them, this jealousy of them. You have wrath, which is an, an outburst of wrath, a, a quick temper. You have strife, which is factions. You have heresies, which is a division or sect. You have seditions, again, a division. This happens when you have people that are being led by their flesh. Okay? And we see it happen in churches all the time. You have envy, which is ill will or spite. And so jealousy is, I want what's yours, and envy is, I hate you for having it. Yeah, I wish you didn't have it. And finally, we have murders, which is slaughter. I mean, you have all of these things, and we see how they connect together. And, and because of our flesh, rather than treating our fellow human as with love and respect and kindness and, and putting them first, instead, we hate that they have things we don't have. We get angry at them, and, and we keep unforgiving them. We have bitterness in our heart toward them. There's all of this animosity that happens, and it builds, and we've seen it build in this church. We've seen it build in, in all of our relationships. Okay, isn't, it, isn't it awful that you can think back to a time that, you, that now you have a broken relationship with somebody, and you can think back to the time that everything was okay, that everything was good, that, that, that there was just that you know, love and respect there? And now it's just there's this, this brokenness. Why does that happen? It's because of our flesh. Because we're selfish, because we live for ourselves. So all of this is product of our flesh. Finally, in verse 21, Paul continues. He says, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. And these are the addictive sins. There we have drunkenness, just desiring to be in a continual state of intoxication with whatever substance you choose. And then revelings, which is uh, a complete lack of control. Uh, the word actually means carousel. It's the idea of just, just going nuts, going crazy, doing whatever you want. And many times it's translated orgies. And it's just, it's just de- devouring everything that you want right now all the time. It's living for your flesh. And so these are this list of sins. And then Paul doesn't finish there. He says, and such like. It's like, hey, listen, if I didn't hit you hard enough yet, just know that this is just the start of a long list that the flesh produces in your life. And when we look at our lives and we find the marks of these things, like I said, some to different degrees than others, but all of us, we find ourselves in this list. Okay? And, and notice as we look at this list, it's not just our outward sins. Some of these sins, the, the envy and the jealousy, we keep hidden well, but it's in our hearts. And, and God knows it's there, and Paul knows that it's there. And these are things that the Spirit is trying to deal with us on. And so he finishes in Galatians 5.21, Of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Very powerful words. And, and that's very terrifying words. Um, it's important to, to note that when he says those that do those things will not inherit the kingdom of God, he's not saying that if, you have, if you've done that in the past, you have no hope. Okay? And he's not even saying if you, if you act upon one of those things and then repent of it, that, that you have no hope. The idea there is if you have a habit of doing these things, if you live for these things and you have no conviction and you're not changing and you're not trying to work on yourself, if there's no fruit of your salvation, if there's no fruit that the Spirit is working in you, then those people will not inherit the kingdom of God, though they might claim to be believers. If somebody claims to be a believer and and all of those things are patterns in their lives and nothing is changing and they're they're ongoing sins, they're not working on them, there's no evidence of their salvation. And so those that do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So here, quickly, is the application for us. Number one, the enemy is you. We will never see ourselves as needy as we are until we understand that we are the source of our greatest problem. It's not external. It's not outside of us. It's not your past. It's not your mother. It's not where you grew up. 
It's not your circumstances. It's not your boss. It's not your workplace. It's not the people you work with. Okay? It's not the people at your school. It's not your brother or your sister. We blame everybody else except for ourselves. It's not those things. Your sin, it's internal. It starts with you. And so let's not keep blaming everybody else. Remember, first sin takes place, and what does Adam do? He blames Eve. Okay, it's the woman, and then he blames God that you gave me. We always are looking to other people. One of the most incredible things that I've noticed about people is their apparent lack of self-awareness. Okay, if you watch people for any period of time, if you like doing that, you'll notice that there are many people that are insanely selfish, but they hate selfishness in other people. It's like, really? Like, you don't see that all the time in you. And yet you're able to, to look at somebody else and see one selfish deed and just hate them because they're so caught up in themselves. People are Now, here's the thing. I say this because I, I see it in people all the time. I know it has to be true of myself. I know that, that in my life, when I try to accurately assess my life, this must also be true, that there are areas in my life that are just blind spots. I don't see. I think I have something covered, and I really don't. Okay? But this is true for all of us. So, I mean, the only hope we have of ever changing is having the Holy Spirit of God shine lights in those dark recesses of our hearts and exposing to us that you were more of a sinner than we thought we were. And that is exactly what happens. That is what the Word of God does. Okay? It is quick and powerful. It discerns the thoughts and the intents of our hearts. That is the Word of God. What we find when we discern the thoughts and intents of our heart is that they're worse than we thought they were. When I look at my life and I look back at some of the reasons I made decisions I made, at the time I thought I was being like, you know, really godly, really right. And now I look back on that, I'm like, man, what was I thinking? How could I have that kind of a motive? How evil am I? That's what happens. We get into the Word of God, we let the Holy Spirit work, and His convicting light shows us who we really are. Can I just read you a couple of verses from, we'll read first Isaiah chapter 64, and then Romans chapter 3. And this is, the enemy is you. Okay? And I'm just really trying to convince you of that. And so, Isaiah 64 verse 6 says, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Okay. All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And I, I used to like to think that, he was, that what Isaiah was saying was, compared to how good God is, all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Or, or just saying, well, in order to merit our salvation, they can't help at all, and so basically they're like filthy rags. But what he's actually saying is, even, even so many of the good things we do are negatively motivated that even the right things are actually as filthy rags. Because our motives were wrong in doing them. Okay, you know you can do the right thing with the wrong motive and it doesn't make it less sinful. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 to 19, one of the most scathing condemnations of all of mankind found in Scripture. Paul says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have deceit. The poison of asps is upon their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and that all the world may become guilty before God. Paul is not condemning the wicked idolaters of the day. He's not condemning those that would go to the temple false, of false gods and practice prostitution to worship them. Okay? That happened all around him. Paul is condemning every single person that has ever lived. It's those of us that think we're good. All the world may become guilty before God. And that's what the law does. And so when we see ourselves for who we are, we find out that we are our own worst enemy. 
There's a song that's by Casting Crowns called Stained Glass Masquerade. And it's a great song. The words are very insightful about the state of the church. And it's, it's really so sad. It's so unfortunate that many churches you go to, you feel as though you have to put on some kind of air of godliness. Like if, if you don't, then they wouldn't accept you. They wouldn't want you there. That they'd you know, just look at you funny, cross-eyed. And so this song says this. Is there anyone that fails? Is there anyone that falls? Am I the only one in church today feeling so small? Because when I take a look around, everybody seems so strong. I know they'll soon discover that I don't belong. So I tuck it all away like everything's okay. If I make them all believe it, maybe I'll believe it too. So with a painted grin, I play the part again. So everyone will see me the way I see them. Are we happy plastic people under shiny plastic steeples with walls around our weakness and smiles to hide our pain? But if the invitation's open to every heart that has been broken, maybe then we close the curtain on our stained glass masquerade. Is there anyone who's been there? Are there any hands to raise? Am I the only one who's traded in the altar for a stage? The performance is convincing, and we know every line by heart. Only when no one is watching can we really fall apart. But would it set me free if I dared to let you see the truth behind the person you imagine me to be? Would your arms be open, or would you walk away? Would the love of Jesus be enough to make you stay? The song is so important for us to understand that living a life here at church where we're faking it, where we're pretending, where we're acting, it's just a waste of time. It is the opposite of what church is supposed to be. We're supposed to be able to come here and be honest. And so what I want us to do tonight is just be able to honestly look at ourselves and say, I am my worst enemy. My flesh, it's wicked. It's evil inside of me. That's who I am. I I don't want you to think, I think this of me. I know me better than you know me. And so if you've ever thought bad things about me, trust me, I've thought much worse things about me. Because they're true. I am wicked. (laughs) The church is full of broken people, full of wicked people. If you're not broken, you don't belong here. If you don't think you're sick, then, then don't come to a hospital, right? Here's the truth. You and I are both wicked and vile, evil sinners apart from the saving blood of Christ. Our only hope is the Holy Spirit of God empowering us, And even with that, even as the Holy Spirit is in us and empowering us, we will continue to struggle with our flesh. And all of this, it it makes the church exciting. It's an amazing thing. Think about it. God has given us his spirit. He's given us this mission. We're all united under the blood of Christ. We have so much to be united about. But then all of us here have this flesh that we battle. And so it's an exciting place because we're all supposed to be unified under this one mission to bring glory to God and to tell the gospel to the nations. And yet we're still struggling with ourselves. It's exciting that we have to overcome this together to do what we're called to do. Any other club couldn't work this way. Any other club that demanded you to come and and to give of yourselves, to give more than you receive, to help each other, to actually openly correct one another, it couldn't work except the church. And that's God's design for the church. So our only hope is the Spirit of God empowering us We have a higher calling, something to be unified for, a greater cause. And we battle this flesh that we battle ourselves. We battle it together. Our worst enemy is ourselves. Number two, the battle will be hard. This is the battle of the natural versus supernatural. Um, In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, Paul writes, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherein take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand, withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. We wrestle against principalities, against powers. There is darkness in this world. We're wrestling events. This is this is a hard battle. In 2 Timothy 2.4, he says, No man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life, then it may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. It's a war that's going on. In 1 Timothy 1.18, Paul tells Timothy to war a good warfare. He says in 
1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith. Over and over again, this is a battle that we're in. D.L. Moody said it would be much easier to find a man that had not done any one sin than to find a man who had done it only once. Sin multiplies. We must either overcome sin or overcome us. That's true. Our, our flesh gets this appetite for sin, and it, it's, it's a battle. It is hard. We must fight. Charles Spurgeon said, Is sin so luscious that you will burn in hell for it? That's an interesting question because it seems like a very obvious answer, right? Is sin so luscious that we would burn in hell for it? And yet it seems like so many people choose, yes, it is. It's a battle. It's... Okay, so you're a believer in Christ. If you know Christ is your Savior, you have a million reasons to live a holy life. Your God is holy, so you be holy, right? He loved you so much that he sent his son to die in your place. That, that Jesus shed his blood for your sin. We have so many reasons to never, ever sin again. The battle's hard. Why is it that we, why is it we hate the sin that we do? But we do it. Why is Paul writing things like, the good that I want to do, I don't do, and the bad that I don't want to do, that's what I do, and oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the bondage of sin? Paul writes that. This is, we look to the Bible, we look, the greatest Christians ever lived, the Apostle Paul, he struggled with this all the time. It's a tough battle. And then he says that it's it's through Christ that we can have the victory. Praise the Lord for that. But it's a tough battle. I am my own worst enemy. And it's a battle. It's a battle we're going to face. And I hate to be a really downer tonight. I know I kind of am being. But it's a battle we'll face until our last breath. Until we die and we're translated to glory. And that, that's the day when we see Christ. We'll never struggle with this again. Here's the good news. Victory is within reach. Paul did not give this list so that the Galatians would hang their heads in shame, in defeat, and resign themselves to their sinful nature. Paul didn't say, listen, this is who you are in your flesh. And just to to knock them down, to tell them that they had no hope, that they couldn't make it. In fact, it's the opposite. He gave them this list to say, yes, it is very difficult. Yes, you can't do it by yourself. Yes, this is where your flesh is going to always go. But there is help. There is power. There's something outside of you that's available to you to help you overcome this sin, this flesh, as strong and as awful as it is, as much as is ingrained in who you are, there is power outside of you to help you. Once again, we find ourselves back in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It, it's, a, it's a wonderful verse. It sounds easy. Walking in the Spirit, just, just do it. It's not easy. It's very hard. It's going to be the greatest battle that you ever face. But it's worth fighting. It's, it's the power that we have. It's the only way we, have, we can overcome. We need to daily walk with God. We need to put out the effort. We need to, to take the step and know that as we take the step toward holiness and, and trying to battle our sin and be self-disciplined, that we have the Spirit of God helping us to take that step. It is the only hope we have of ever overcoming our, our sin. God has called us as his children, to be his ambassadors on this earth. He's called us to to take who he is and make it evident to our friends and to our neighbors and to our family. And unfortunately, we fall short in this many times. And what I want want us to do, this this is what I hope we leave with. I hope we leave with this desire to be morally upright, this desire to see our flesh and say, I don't want that anymore. But I want us to understand that if all we leave with tonight is a desire that we're absolutely going to fail, but that the Holy Spirit is the power we need to overcome. There's a huge danger in a sermon on morality if it's not grounded in the power of the Holy Spirit. Your willpower is nothing unless you have the empowerment of the Spirit. So all of us, let's, let's this week say, what's it going to look like for me to walk with the Spirit? It'll look like time in prayer. It'll look like time in the Word. It will look like you trying to kill your flesh, saying no, and believing that the Spirit will help you as you do that. We need to to really put faith in God. We need to be all in. 
It, it's so foolish to think that we can sit on the fence. You sit on the fence and you're saying, I'm going to feed my flesh, I'm going to feed the spirit. It doesn't work. Your flesh always wins that. You're feeding the flesh, it, boom. So let's this week try and live lives that truly glorify God. And listen, you're not always going to be perfect. And you're going to fail. But get back up in the power of the spirit. Claim the victory that's been given to us. Let's pray.